Hello, and welcome to this special edition of Inside Judicial Watch. I'm your host, Amelia Kane, and with us today is Jack Posobiec. He is the One America News correspondent and host. Jack, thank you so much for being here today. I appreciate being here, Layla. Thanks for having me. Now, Judicial Watch received information from a U.S. government source regarding U.S. Ambassador to Ukraine, Marie Ivanovich, spying on conservative journalists. The list is pretty extensive. There's Sean Hannity, Sarah Carter, Donald Trump Jr., the list goes on. And Jack, you were on that list, is that correct? I, I found myself there. I mean, I, I saw um, when Tom first put out the list on Judicial Watch, I think my name was actually first. So uh, it was quite a shock to find myself on, on a list of, you know, and we're, we're still waiting to get more information on how exactly this monitoring of, of whether it was social media, whether it went beyond that, uh, went beyond that, but it's certainly always interesting to find your name on, on a, a government list of any kind. Exactly, exactly. It's a bit disturbing. Would you say that? Well, absolutely, because you know it really smacks of the type of government implements that you'd, you'd see in a country that doesn't necessarily follow American values. I mean, this is uh, the United States. We have the, free, the First Amendment that protects both freedom of speech mm -hmm. of all U.S. citizens as well as freedom of the press. Uh, working at One American News, uh, predominantly what I'm doing is reporting on what's going on in U.S. foreign policy, what's going on around the world. Um, there was obviously some stories involving that ambassador, but I've been reporting on Ukraine writ large for years, um, and it, a lot of information that didn't necessarily have to do with her. So I don't know exactly what it was that put me to the very top of that list, um, but I, I can only imagine it has to do with my series of reporting on Ukraine. Mm -hmm. Now, Yovanovitch testified in secret back in October. Um, now that's been made public, what do you think of it? Right. I noticed that, um, you know, certainly as soon as the testimony came out, I went to see, of course, my name was in there, um, but also wanted to see if there were any specific portions where she spoke to this and whether any information was given. It seemed like she really tried to downplay it, um, this program of monitoring that went on. But one thing that I thought was very interesting uh, in her testimony was that she referred to finished products. Um, so, uh, by background, I'm a prior Navy intelligence officer. I've worked in the federal government for the intelligence community. I've done both ONI, DIA, uh, I've served at Guantanamo Bay, so I've done a lot of work in the intel community. And when I hear the phrase finished product, that actually has a set definition and a set meaning in the intel community. That means that you've taken something that came in as raw intelligence, whether you know it comes from classified sources or open sources, and has then been processed and analyzed by either a team or a group of analysts or some type of fusion center that is then brought together and into a, you know, a PDF or a, a PowerPoint. Uh, typically, if you're talking State Department, you're, you're gonna see more of like PDFs. They, they're very text-based. Um, and so, this is not something where uh, somebody's just going on Twitter and you know reading my you know tweets on any given day. This is something where a level of analysis has been put into this, uh, possibly commentary has been put into this, and we don't know exactly why. We don't know exactly how this program got started. She also mentioned that she reached back to the State Department headquarters here in Washington, D.C., but that the request wasn't able to go through. Now, she says it was because of a lack of resources. She mentioned that in her testimony. But Judicial Watch has reported that there was pushback from uh, folks in Washington, D.C. saying, you know, essentially, we, we don't do that. We don't target U.S. citizens. We don't target U.S. Uh, media for monitoring at this level. I mean, it's one thing to say, you know, hey, we read some of the news this morning, here's the, the top clips. This, this wasn't press clippings, it sounds like. If she's reading finished products, that means that there's some level in, of analysis that went into this. Do you have any idea what kind of information they gathered? At this point, I don't have any evidence to one way or the other, what exactly was gathered, what exactly was was codified. I mean, we've seen things where the government has used uh, tweets and emails in certainly a special counsel investigation. They've been used in indictments. They've been used in FISA warrants. Uh, we've seen this over the course of the past two years. So in any situation where you're hearing that the federal government is collecting information on you, uh, you certainly have that worry that it could lead to something you know, quite larger. Now, why would Yovanovitch be targeting conservative journalists and not 
liberal journalists, for example. So one thing that was interesting in her testimony was that she stated that she, she felt threatened um, and that she felt but it sounded like personally threatened, and I, I know I certainly have never personally threatened uh, any U.S. ambassador, let alone her. And uh, I don't recall any of the reporting that, I know John Solomon did a series of reports regarding her that necessarily threatened her personally, but what I think that um, she may have been feeling was threatened in terms of her position because there were questions that were being raised about what exactly she was doing in terms of her diplomacy with the Ukrainian administration at the time, things that she was doing that may not have been in line with the administration's principles, in line with the administration's foreign policy. And that same, I guess, dual track in terms of, you know, President Trump having his, of course, uh, American first policy, this is what he ran on, it's what he campaigned on, he speaks about this at every rally, uh, versus these, these Obama holdovers who had a very different type of foreign policy, and this has been sort of part of the interplay that we've seen uh, between elements of sort of this, the administrative government, the bureaucracy, the permanent bureaucracy class, and the Trump administration from day one. Uh, this sort of clash of, of policy there. And so what's interesting to me is, to, is that so much of this has now spilled over into the House and has exploded into the impeachment inquiry uh, that Adam Schiff is now running, and that's what her testimony came under, so that these policy differences between herself and the White House, herself and the presidency, have gotten so large that they're actually trying to uh, lead to an impeachment of the President of the United States over what really amounts to is foreign policy differences. Uh, they have a more internationalist sort of uh, uh, goal that they've been pushing towards. That was the agenda. President Trump ran against that. It was a very much more America first. Uh, he certainly ran on rooting out corruption, ran on rooting, on, rooting out law and order. Um, in issues and justices. So if there were any situation where, and obviously information had been presented to him that he felt that corruption investigations should go on in Ukraine, that the U.S. wasn't pressing for, uh, there was this information that essentially that she had countermanded his, uh, or countermanded some of his requests for investigations of certain individuals, um, that was not done in concert with the Secretary of State, Mike Pompeo, or certainly not done in concert with the White House. And so all of those questions really go to the heart of the matter of what foreign policy goals was she pursuing at the time, and were those counter to the foreign policy goals of the president? Mm -hmm. Now, to dive in further, why were you of all people targeted? Well, something that I've done at One American News is that we've covered the Ukraine story from the very start. I mean, I started at One American News um, just under two years ago. And one of my very first stories was about collusion between the DNC and Ukraine. And these stories go back all the way to 2017 in articles that we saw in Politico, articles that we saw in the New York Times later, an entire series of articles talking about Ukrainian contractors out of the embassy of Ukraine here in Washington, D.C. Now keep in mind, this is the Ukrainian embassy to America, not the U.S. embassy, US embassy in Ukraine, which where Yovanovitch was. So, mm -hmm. But essentially her counterparts here in Washington were actually working hand in hand with DNC contractors, uh, Alexandra Chalupa being really one of the, the prominent ones of this, that were trying to essentially find dirt on President Trump, uh, on Paul is, Manafort. This is very interesting. Can you repeat what you just said, that the DNC was colluding with the, uh, with the Ukrainian em, um, embassy? Right, and this is what we see in, this is what Politico reports in January 2017. Uh, they report that there was collusion between the Ukrainian embassy and the DNC to find dirt on Trump, and that some of that dirt may have found its way into uh, what we now call the Steele dossier. Mm -hmm. And so, as part of my investigation into this, investigative reporting into this, I've actually had on a whistleblower of our own uh, who served in that Ukrainian embassy and has given key testimony and has released statements regarding this collusion and what he saw and what he overheard going on in the embassy. His statements have been backed up by the ambassador at the time, that they were reached out to by members of the DNC. This, this Chalupa figure, uh, who was a contractor for them at the time, did reach out to them in attempt to essentially find foreign dirt on President Trump. 
has she had a history of monitoring other law-abiding American citizens besides you and this list of others? I'm not sure for her specifically. I, I have no history with this person. I've never met her. Um, but we certainly know that the Obama administration writ large has had a, a history of targeting um, either journalists or political activists, Tea Party members, uh, up to and including members of President Trump's, then at the time candidate Trump's campaign uh, for monitoring, for surveillance, for FISA warrants, for unmasking, like we saw with General Flynn at the time he was a private citizen uh, in his capacity as the essentially incoming national security advisor. Mm -hmm. So we've seen these tools of the government, these tools of the national security apparatus being used on U.S. citizens. And there's always some a papered over explanation. Oh, well, we thought they may have been colluding with Russia. Oh, we thought they might be some sort of KGB, you know, I guess FSB operation or something like that. But when in reality, uh, you peel away the layers and it turns out that it's just patriotic Americans, or in this case, conservative media, conservative reporters and correspondents doing their jobs and trying to report what they find out in real life that's going on in, mem in the world and with the government. Are you surprised that Marie Ivanovich, as an Obama holdover, had you on this so-called enemies list, which I think is an interesting name, an enemies list? It does kind of feel like an enemies list at that point. Uh, I, I've, I certainly wouldn't consider her an, an enemy uh, in any way, but uh, you know, if she considers my information that I've, that I've been reported to be problematic in any way, I'd I've certainly welcome her to come on One America News and explain any of it. I'd welcome her to you know, sit down for an interview and, and we could talk through some of these things. Again, you know, I'm trying to get to the heart of the matter and I'm not really picking sides in terms of whether she was doing something right or doing something wrong. I'm trying to figure out what she is doing and why she's doing it from that example. And so uh, because I focused on Ukraine, I you know, by way of background, I'm Polish, so I kind of have that Eastern European background. But also I think that Ukraine, Russia, and the U.S. relationship there has been such a major role in U.S. politics and U.S. foreign policy over the last five years going back that it is something that is extremely important. That's why I've always made it a focus. I know that um, certainly other networks have focused more on Russia, and we've certainly done our, our fair share of coverage of, of Russia, but I've always made sure to carve out space for Ukraine to continue that story going forward. And so because of that, it doesn't really surprise me uh, that they would be following what I was doing, but hopefully not following it from, a, from an adversarial perspective. Mm -hmm. Now, how does it feel to be on this list? In one sense, it felt shocking, but in another sense, it felt, hey, I should be on the top of the list. If you're going to be on the list, you might as well be number one, right? <laughs> hey, do you sense a do you sense a feeling of being patriotic, being at the top of this list, or no? I mean, I, I don't know if patriotic is the word I would use, but certainly uh, a sense of well, if I'm in good company, and I feel like that is a list of where, where I'm in good company. I see a lot of a lot of friends on there, and a lot of fellow colleagues that are that are doing a lot of the same stuff that we're doing. And I, I think it speaks to the efficacy of One American News writ large, is what we've done as a network. Uh, only got started about five years ago and have really just exploded onto the scene. And now with our breaking news, getting uh, more and more scoops, getting ahead of the curve in terms of a lot of these news stories, digging deeper than we've seen anyone on cable news doing, um, that it's really a testament to what they've been able to do at the network in terms of pushing forward and going places that, that people haven't gone before in terms of what we're reporting, the information that we're finding, and the sources that are willing to come to us and speak again on camera, telling us about the things they did, the things that they saw, and giving information that no one else is talking about. Now, obviously, you work at on One American News. Was there anything that you were able to find in your reporting regarding the ambassador? Essentially, was what I was able to find in my reporting on the ambassador through talking to some of my own sources in the government is that the people that heard about this program, the people that heard about this uh, targeting program of monitoring U.S. conservatives, journalists, allies of the president, friends of the president, family members of the president, um, that they were the ones who actually brought forward this situation and said, this needs to stop first. And these were people who, um, from what I understand, weren't necessarily, uh, you know, uh, 
what you'd consider a Trump supporter. Uh, they're actually people who you'd probably be more um, more willing to categorize as part of that that bureaucrat class. But it's ingrained into anyone who serves in the intelligence community uh, this thing called Executive Order 12333. So 12333. And this was signed by Ronald Reagan. And it involves the essentially the national security powers of the United States and its national security um, executive order. And what's drilled into you is that these tools, these abilities that we have access to are not to be used on U.S. citizens, are not to be used to target U.S. citizens, certainly uh, actually U.S. persons is the word that's used, uh, certainly not you know, members of campaigns or, or uh, media, because these are meant to be used for only lawful purposes. And so for them to then have essentially broken that, is, is what it sounds like, mm -hmm. really drives home something that's just one of the bedrock pieces of training, the pillars of the intelligence community of, you know, sort of the, uh, uh, the worker bees of, of, the, of, the, of the IC, that we know that, you know, you're not supposed to use these to look up your ex-boyfriend, you're not supposed to look, use these to look up your in-laws, you know, that kind of thing, right, which uh, it's sad to say it does happen. <laughs> but, um, you know, we know that even on a higher level, this should not be done to wage politics or to wage political fights using these tools because to do so is to politicize the very national security apparatus. Number one, that should never be used for that intention, but number two, is there to keep Americans safe, is there to inform the government about what's going on, and is there to enact, again, U.S. policy as set by the president? Does it look like they were just trying to enforce their own agenda? It certainly seems, given what we now know of the testimony, it seems what we now know, and certainly based on that list of, you know, I, one thing I actually did was I went through every single one of those Twitter accounts and I ran a search for her name on all of those accounts. And one thing that you will see across all of them is that we did all tweet about her at least once around March of 20, uh, 2019. And so I'm wondering if that had anything to do with it. But what you can really see is that this is someone who clearly had an agenda that was not on the same page as the president because if she was willing to get on the same page as the president, she could have just picked up the phone or written an email, got in contact with the White House, mm -hmm. found out what was going on, and wouldn't have had to go to such extreme lengths as to try to monitor people on social media. I mean, this is not the procedure that you'd see you know, somebody doing in the US government if they were doing the right thing. You'd, you'd see somebody reaching back, finding out what the situation was, and going about it through official channels, not through these, these monitoring programs. Especially a US ambassador to Ukraine, right? Right, exactly. I mean, it, you have to wonder if this is someone who uh, feared for her job. I mean, she did eventually lose her position. Um, but you also wonder if, if this was some kind of program that she had opened, what were the auspices that she used to, to start this? What was the inciting act? Did she claim that there was some threat from, from people reporting on her activities? What did she tell her staff? And so I imagine there would be documents, emails, phone calls, records, if there were meetings, conference calls, uh, if there were as there is analysis done, uh, PowerPoints, PDFs, anything that would have been created regarding this program. And I think that uh, th certainly those of us who have been affected by this uh, are owed you know, an understanding of what went on here. But for the American public writ large, I think we should understand what is happening if one of our elected officials, or in this case an unelected official, is using government tools on U.S. citizens. Exactly. Now you mentioned that you were in good company being on this list. Have you been in contact with anyone else? So uh, some of the folks on the list are uh, work for a, a fellow uh, conservative media channel, so I don't really uh, talk to that crew very, very much. but. Um, uh, there's some people on the list that I talked to. Certainly, I've interviewed Donald Trump Jr. on One American News. I've interviewed Rudy Giuliani, so we've had communication there. Uh, Ryan Saavedra, some that I talk to via Twitter on a you know, fairly, fairly uh, regular basis, almost every day, and uh, a few of the other folks on there as well. And so I've I've asked them about it, and uh, they all feel, in some way, or um, at least I could say from from one perspective, there's there's a common thread of we've been targeted because we were telling the truth. Mm -hmm. Now, what do you hope to happen in this story? 
Well, what I would happen is that there's a full accountability of what went on, right? There's a full accounting and accountability for this, that, that other people come forward, they explain what exactly happened, they give us the information, you know, is this as nefarious as it sounds? What other information was collected if, in terms of information? Were you looking at uh, phone records? Were they looking at, you know, certainly I've, I've had phone calls to Ukraine in the course of my reporting. Was that something that was looked at as a, you know, potential, uh, you know, investigation? Um, what other elements of the government were brought into this, if any? And so these are the major questions that we would have. I mean, I even have friends that still, uh, believe it or not, that still work in the intelligence community. And when they saw this article, they started calling me saying, hey, Jack, are, are, are we on this list now because we are friends with you and we you know, just talk socially even though we've maintained that relationship? So this is something that has put a lot of people in uh, a very awkward position and they want to understand what exactly is going on and why it was going on. We've seen government uh, misconduct time and time again at the Department of Justice level. We've seen it uh, certainly you know, in the Department of De Defense level. And if we're seeing it now at the Department of State level, we want to know exactly what was going on. And you know, I would hope that um, you know, whether or not the IG is gonna look into it, that'd be great. Or if the Attorney General is gonna look into it, um, I just want answers. Mm -hmm. And Judicial Watch is fighting against government corruption. This past October, we filed a Freedom of Information request um, with the State Department. And if we don't hear back from them within a timely manner, we are going to file a lawsuit against them. But thank you, Jack, and thank you for tuning in into Inside Judicial Watch. If you like this video, please visit our website, donate to our work, and find us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. Thank you.